Today's lecture is going to cover the brainstem, cerebellum, sensory receptors, sensory and motor pathways. The midbrain is the first region that we're going to talk about. Where the midbrain is located is right in here. It's also known as the mesencephalon. The features that you need to know from this region are the cerebral peduncles, the corpora quadrigemina, the cerebral aqueduct, and the substantia nigra. The cerebral peduncles are actually known as um, pedestals. They really hold up the two sides of the cerebrum. They are locations where tracks of nerves are going, but they've branched off, some going off to the right and some going off to the left hemisphere. So the cerebral peduncles you can see in this area, but you really don't see the cerebral peduncles very well from this sagittal view. So if we look at this from an anterior view, we can see these cerebral peduncles located in this area. And this is where the fiber tracks are actually branching off into the right and left sides of the cerebral hemispheres. The corpora quadrigemina is a group of four bumps. So that's where the quad is. Four bumps on the posterior side of the brain. So we have two bumps here, and because of this is a sagittal section, you're only seeing two on the right, and then there'll be two on the left to make a total of four. So the best way to view the corpora quadrigemina that's right here is actually from a posterior view. So this next image I'm gonna show you has this cerebellum region removed so we can more clearly see this. So this here is the posterior view. The cerebellum has been removed from this location, and we have the corpora quadrigemina are these four bumps. So we have this bump area, this, this, and this. So those are the four bumps that make up the corpora quadrigemina. The two superior bumps are known as the superior colliculi, and the two inferior bumps are known as the inferior colliculi. The superior colliculi are located right in this region. So again, from the sagittal view, we only see one. The superior colliculus here, or the superior colliculi as they are plural, are responsible for visual tracking. If you are watching a baseball game, you might watch a pitcher throw the ball to a batter, and so you're tracking the ball. You, the batter's gonna hit the ball, launches it out, and you can now visually let your eyes follow that ball's trajectory. So the superior colliculus actually controls the muscles of our eye and helps us to track with our visual field so that we can make sure what we're looking at, we're able to follow it. The inferior colliculi that are located here they are, have a, more of a role with hearing. So if you're again watching the same baseball game and you hear the ball hit the bat or the bat swings and hits the ball, so the crack of the bat hitting the ball, you will hear that. And based on how your head is positioned, the sound waves are gonna come into one ear and then the next. And it helps you to triangulate the sound and that way you can then connect your eyes to look at the source of the sound. So anytime you hear something, you know, a backfire of a vehicle, some off to some distance or, you know, some other noise or door slamming, you can tell which direction to look for that hearing because of your inferior colliculi. One additional thing I'd like to point out for this region is the pineal gland. Now the pineal gland we discussed in our last lecture about the diencephalon. And so it's the portion region of our brain that secretes melatonin. It happens to that we know the epithalamus is above the thalamus, but it has a large bulbous region on the posterior side. So this little area right up top in the middle, so just above the corpora quadrigemina, is where our pineal gland would be. The next region you need to know for the midbrain is the cerebral aqueduct. The cerebral aqueduct is a little tunnel located right in this region. It connects the third ventricle with the fourth ventricle. So the cerebral aqueduct is really just a little tunnel, like a little ditch that runs through here that's allowing cerebral spinal fluid to go from the third ventricle down here into the fourth ventricle. And finally, the substantia nigra is located in the midbrain. The 
importance of the substantia nigra, and in particular, here's these little regions of the substantia nigra, they are where dopamine is created. It, the melanin is actually a component utilized to make dopamine. And so this area is often quite pigmented. However, people that have Parkinson's disease have pathology is located right here in the substantia nigra. And people with Parkinson's disease have a marked reduced area of this substantia nigra due to their insufficient release of dopamine. The reticular activating system is really about our consciousness or our wakefulness. Really, our consciousness, if you want to think of it more as our awareness of our surrounding. So if you're aware of traffic on a road, if you live next to a really busy road and you're hearing traffic all the time, eventually you just tune that out. And that's your reticular activating system doing the tuning out. And so it's filtering out non-essential stimuli. And then if there's a different noise that comes from outside, then that actually comes through that you become aware of it. The reticular activating system is also in charge of our wakefulness. And our wakefulness is really how much stimuli we're letting up into our consciousness or awareness. So people that are in a coma, have a reticular activating system that are filtering out a significant amount of the stimuli so they're not aware of anything going on around them really it's blocking that and so they're not their awareness is significantly reduced there so that is the role of the reticular activating system and it is located known as the reticular formation where you have the midbrain as well as the pons and medulla, which is the brain stem. So all of this come into play here. So our brain stem and midbrain really are about the gateway of what information we're allowing to come up into our brain. We can see here the tracks that actually go up through our brain stem as well as our midbrain as it goes out these cerebral peduncles here. So this is kind of a nice representation of the fiber tracks coming up through this region. The brainstem itself is this location of the pons and the medulla oblongata. Both regions are involved in breathing. The medulla oblongata in particular is involved in the rate, how rapid your breathing is where the pons is more involved in the depth of breathing. So they do have their own unique takes on breathing and they're both involved in controlling our respiration. The medulla oblongata has the additional components of involving cardiovascular control. And finally, the medulla oblongata is a location where we have crossover of our fibers, both our motor as well as our sensory, or otherwise referred to as our efferent and afferent fibers. In this picture, this crossover takes place right here. You can see that an impulse coming in from the periphery might come up the spinal cord, and when it gets to the point of the medulla oblongata, it crosses over to the other side of the body to go to the sensory region on the opposite side of the brain. Likewise, if we were to have motor control on, say, on this side of the brain, it's going to travel down through the brain, it crosses over, and we control the opposite muscles on the opposite side of our body from whence they came in the brain. The cerebellum is a region on the back posterior side of the brain. We can see the cerebellum here in this. The cerebellum has a little bit of a difference in texture. We're used to the cerebrum looking like a bunch of worms. The cerebellum has got these really fine lines. We see the inside part within here, that's known as the arbor vitae, as the tree of life. So the white lines within the cerebellum are the arbor vitae. The role of the cerebellum is really about our motor movement coordination. So we have motor with our sensory input. This means, although up in the frontal lobe, if you recall, where we have the sort of premotor cortex, is going to control the primary motor cortex, 
which is the puppet master of our brain where we actually have nerves that end on every skeletal muscle throughout our body. So that's where our motor control comes. But our cerebellum provides additional feedback to our premotor cortex that's planning out the muscle sequence to tell the primary motor cortex which muscles to actually activate. So if you're walking, the sequence pattern for stepping one foot down, lifting the other foot up, push, moving it forward, leaning your body weight forward, placing that foot down, lifting your opposite foot up, there's a, a very complex sequence that has to be recruited of muscles in a very specific order. In doing so, that is the premotor cortex. The primary cord it tells the primary cortex which muscles need to be activated at a specific time. I like to think of it as a piano player, that's the premotor cortex, and the actual piano, when you hit the keys, executes a specific note. In the sense of the brain, it will cause a specific muscle to be um, activated. So the role of the cerebellum in this is based on sensory input. If you're walking and perhaps you step on a, a wet surface on tile and your foot slides out, that type of sensory input that our cerebellum is also a location for proprioceptive information. It knows where our body is in space. And so when our foot slips, it sends that information up to the premotor cortex so we can adjust some of the muscle recruitments. So it's going to fine tune our movements based on the sensory input that we get and what's going on with our body. So the processing within the cerebellum is it knows the positions of our joints. It actually is in our has endings, it's within our tendons and ligaments to understand and know the tension, the type of muscle tone we have in a specific region of our body, um, and which tells us the state of muscular contraction. Do we have tone in that we're somewhat contracted or is it completely relaxed and totally flaccid? These type of sensory body positioning information is what is going to the cerebellum. And that's why it can provide additional input to a premotor cortex and a primary cortex. The structures within the mesencephalon, you should know the cerebral peduncles, you should know the corpora quadrigemina and the components of the corpora quadrigemina, which is the superior colliculi and the inferior colliculi. You should know that the superior colliculi are required for eye tracking of movement. The inferior colliculi are for triangulating hearing, so we can turn our head to the source of a sound. The cerebral aqueduct is a connection, a little tunnel, so that cerebral spinal fluid can go from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. And we have the substantia nigra, which are dark regions within this part of the brain that is where we have, or creating dopamine. The pathology associated with this region, if there is not a sufficient amount of dopamine being produced, would result in Parkinson's disease. The location of the cardiovascular and respiratory centers are in the pons and medulla oblongata. The pons is responsible for your depth of breathing, deep or shallow breaths, whereas the medulla oblongata is responsible for the rate of breathing. The medulla oblongata also is responsible for our cardiovascular centers. It is also the location where crossover takes place, where we have motor control originating, say, on the right side of the brain. It goes down, but it crosses over at the level of the medulla oblongata to then continue down the spinal cord and control our left side of our body. Likewise, our sensory information is going to come up and cross over there as well. The cerebellum knows where we are in space. We know it has a mapping of our positioning based on our joints, our movement, our arm is up, our arm is down, our muscles are taut, our muscles are relaxed. It knows what our body's doing and therefore it provides feedback to our premotor cortex and our primary motor cortex muscle activation sequence to fine tune our movement based on what's going on, whether we have a strong wind pushing us back or whether we're on a slippery surface, it's helping our muscle recruitment adjust to the changing conditions. Now on to sensory and motor processing, also known as neural integration. 
The first part we're going to talk about are just sensory receptors. We have already gone through many of these receptors when we talked about skin. So some of this will be review and a little bit of this will be new. So the types of sensory receptors that we have are nociceptors, nociceptors which detect pain, thermoreceptors which detect temperature, photoreceptors which detect light, chemoreceptors are obviously chemical, they can detect anywhere from like oxygen or carbon dioxide or hydrogen ions, which we know also is pH. So chemoreceptors can detect a myriad of things. So just as a general class, they're known as chemoreceptors. So chemical would just be a general thing. There would be a very specific receptor for oxygen, which is a different receptor than would be for carbon dioxide. The mechanoreceptors, these are the ones we've already spoken about um, when we did in unit one. But these are the receptors that are more associated as far as the tactile ones with the skin. And then we're adding a couple other receptors to this group. The mechanoreceptors, mean tactile or touch, are our free nerve endings, the root hair plexus, so each hair follicle has a nerve to the bottom of it. And it actually helps us tell like if a wind or some sort of breeze goes by and it blows our hair aside or even the hair on our arms, we are aware of that. Sometimes we associate it with some movement, something what went by us very quickly and hair made our hair move slightly and we could detect that movement around. Um, or it is painful if someone plucks a hair because of the nerve endings attached to the root hair plexus. If you recall, the Merkel cells and the Meissners, we talked about the M's, those are both involved with fine touch within the skin. We have the Pacinian corpuscle, those are going to be our deep pressure, like someone just grabbing your wrist and squeezing. And then I think of the Ruffini corpuscles, I think of Ruffini or of being rough, and they usually are associated with distortions. That would be if someone grabbed your arm and sort of twisted it a little, that's movement to the side. So these are detecting different types of movements on your skin. Baroreceptors, the prefix baro refers to pressure. So these are really pressure sensors and the most frequent use of these are gonna be in arteries. So for instance, we have the baroreceptors located up in our neck. So where our carotid arteries come up through our neck and at the base of our jaw, where that carotid artery actually splits, so that part of the artery goes out to the outside of our face and the other part goes inside to the brain. At that location of that Y or that split, we have some baroreceptors and they help monitor pressure to the brain. So if you sit upright very, very quickly, and all of a sudden, you know, based on gravity, you don't have as much blood flowing up towards your brain, people sometimes get lightheaded. Their baroreceptors sense that, and they quickly make the adjustment um, to your blood pressure and your heart rate to fix that. So baroreceptors are really just known as pressure sensors. They're usually found in vessels, but they're in other distensible organs as well. Then there are proprioceptors. Proprioceptors provide a sensory input from our body. For instance, as we're aware of the muscle spindles, those are our rapid stretch reflex. Remember if you tapped your patellar tendon and it caused a rapid stretch of your quadriceps muscle, and so then your body's gonna respond by contracting it, and then your low leg flings out. Remember, the Golgi tendon organs, those are located in your tendons, and if you are contracting your muscle to such a great degree that you actually could cause yourself damage, whether it's pulling a ligament or breaking a bone, the Golgi tendon organ will actually deactivate um, that muscle to protect yourself. And then we have the receptors and joint capsules. This I like to think of as where we are in space. And so that's the idea of if you have your eyes closed, you could tell if your arms are above your head or below your head. You could tell where you, your body limbs are in space. These are receptors that are going back up to your brain to let you know and what your body position is without requiring visual information. So for our sensory processing, we want to remember that the afferent, remember sensory is afferent information, it's coming from out from our body and our periphery, comes into the spinal cord, it will go up, we know it's gonna cross over at the level of the medulla oblongata 
and it comes up here into this thalamus region. The thalamus then determines what kind of information is coming in here. Is it coming from a Pacinian corpuscle or is it coming from a nerve ending, a pain? And where is it coming from the body? It will direct it to the appropriate location along the primary somatosensory cortex. And then beyond that, our somatosensory association area, remember association is, can be thought of as our interpretation area. So we could say something sharp poked my finger. So not only do you have a specific location, finger, but you have a type of feeling, sharp and painful. Did you touch a knife or did you, you know, touch a corner edge of the table? Did you poke, you know, it, it sort of your association area is going to interpret those feelings based on your life experiences. And for motor control, as we recall, motor is going to be efferent. Efferent information is going to originate in the premotor cortex that's going to plan out our muscles that we're going to need. It's sort of putting together the appropriate sequence. If you're going to throw a ball, you have to think of gripping the ball, lifting your arm, bringing it back, arching, bringing your hand further back, and then the propulsion of it by moving your arm forward, finally to the point that you're going to let go and release the ball. That's a whole very, very complex series of movements where you are activating a very specific sequence of muscles in order to get, your, to, get to throw the ball. So this is in the premotor cortex. So the premotor cortex is going to be the place where we plan a sequence of movements. It is going to plan which muscles need to be activated in a very specific pattern. If you are practicing a particular movement or sport and you say you're hitting a hockey puck, if you are every time you hit the puck and you're trying to make a goal and sometimes it goes too high then it goes too far to the right and as you fine tune and adjust how much muscle to use how much force to use and the direction in which muscles you're activating you're actually training your premotor cortex the premotor cortex then tells the primary motor cortex exactly which muscles need to be activated and so it's the muscle Stimulus originates here in the primary motor cortex. They come down the through the brain, crosses over the level of the medulla oblongata, and then it's going to go out the opposite side to control the opposite side of the body. So this is the pathway of motor or efferent control. This is representing the amount of motor neurons and specifically motor units that are dedicated to specific regions of our body. So for instance, even though we have more body mass dedicated, say, to our thigh, we don't have as much brain regions dedicated to that compared to our face or our hands. That is because we have so many more small motor units. A small motor units means it's only recruiting a couple of muscle cells. So we have the capability of incredible fine movement, sort of our expressions on our face or moving our hand in just as fine way to a much greater extent than we would say our thigh muscles and our quadriceps. So our quadriceps, when they send the axons coming from here, it's recruiting hundreds and hundreds of motor units at the same time or muscle cells. A single motor unit would have hundreds and hundreds of muscle cells. So we don't need as much brain space to dedicate to it. And again, and with motor control, the cerebellum is going to receive proprioceptive, remember that's where we are in space, about our position of skeletal muscles, what we're doing, and that's providing also sensory input and adjustments to our motor control. So if we're on a slippery floor surface, then the cerebellum is going to provide that feedback so that our premotor cortex can make the adjustments so then it can tell the primary motor cortex how to alter the contraction sequence so that perhaps if we're walking, we can continue walking without falling down.